today on HR Trends. Welcome to HR Trends. I'm your host, Claire Morin, and today we are talking about 2023 leave trends. We have with us two of the foremost leave experts in the United States, Ellen McCann of Unum and Angel Bennett. Ellen, welcome. It's amazing to have you back. You've been on the podcast numerous times and the audience always loves your insights. Thank you, Claire. I'm really excited to be back. And Angel, first time on the HR Trends podcast. However, we've seen you on many Unum and Sherm webinars. Welcome, Angel. Thank you. Yes, very excited to be here. And what a great time to bring you both in to talk about leave, because, of course, we're recording this end of May 2023. We're in this new world of work where we know employee expectations have really shifted since the pandemic. And two brand new reports have just come out um, that are showing how expectations are really remaining strong. And Ellen, I'd love to ask you about this. I'm just going to reference a couple of data points. A brand new survey from Unum from March 2023 showing that 87% of employers agree that today's employees have greater expectations for how their employer demonstrates care and understanding for them. And also from LIMRA, May 2023 BEAT study, showing the importance of benefits. So according to LIMRA, employees today are overwhelmingly pointing to paid time off benefits, including vacation and sick time, as the most important paid family or medical leave and flexible work schedules are also considered very or extremely important by more than seven in 10 employees. Ellen, what are your thoughts on this? Claire, I'm not surprised by those statistics at all. I'm actually glad to see that employers are starting to recognize what we've seen employee expectations be, and and we've seen that rise over the last couple of years. What I think might be a little bit new in the in this data is that employers are now also finally recognizing it and acknowledging it, which is how we make change, right? So employee expectations can rise, but if employers don't recognize that and acknowledge it, it's hard to change. Uh, so I'm not surprised at all. I think employees through the pandemic, there were a lot of uh, obviously very terrible things that happened in the pandemic, but there were some silver linings as well. And one of that was that employees realized the value of time off. And a lot of employees unfortunately realized they didn't have enough time off to take care of the things they needed to take care of. So their expectation now is that their employer will continue to provide that even in a post-pandemic world. And employers are realizing that they didn't provide enough benefits for their employees. And they're seeing the direct correlation between employee retention and attraction and having a robust leave program. So this is our new normal. This is what employees are expecting and and hopefully employers are recognizing as well that in order to have a competitive total rewards package, they need to have those robust benefits so that employees can feel supported for and cared by their employer. Angel, what are your thoughts? Also, somebody who's, you know, leading the paid leave, you know, um, function for so many employers here at Unum as a benefits provider. Yeah, I think so. I think the workforce has obviously changed since the pandemic, but I do think it started changing even before that as far as what people were looking for from a leave program. I think the pandemic came in, though, and it just accelerated it, right? Further highlighted the need and just accelerated how quickly employers and employees feel like, hey, they have to move, right? I also think it the pandemic also further highlighted just how diverse our workforce is, right? Because you had people in so many different stages of life that highlighted like the importance of the need for the time away because everything kind of came to a head, right, as part of the pandemic. Um, So I think it's really important for employers to continue to recognize that diverse workforce, that diverse um, population of employees that are looking for different types of lead programs. I also think like the the old way of thinking and I think it's probably even old way of thinking just prior to pandemic of like hey what do we need to do for a leave program to really minimize the impact on us right as employers like that was 
the focus. Now that's not the focus anymore, right? The focus is on that employee and that employee experience and work-life balance, right? Further highlighted again as a result of the pandemic. So all of those things I think really did drive and accelerate forward the need for different types of leaves from an employee perspective. It's so true. And I wanted us to come back to that about how employers are changing their leave programs. But before we get there, the sheer legal landscape, too, and what everyone is sort of dealing with in our audience. Ellen, you recently presented at the Health and Benefits Leadership Conference in Las Vegas. And you said this line that really hit me. You said the complexity of the legal landscape for leave is no longer a trend, it's the new normal. <laughs> it's not going to get less complex. Can you talk us through what some of the key things are to know right right now around that PFML landscape? Claire, I think this is, again, always a space that's been complex, but we're just seeing a lot of different kinds of laws that employers have to contend with. And one absence could have five or six different protections attached to it. And employers have to understand how they all work together. Do they run at the same time or concurrently? Do they run consecutively? How do I put this puzzle together for my employees? And what we're really seeing is we saw growth, of course, in unpaid leave laws. Uh, and we, we know the FMLA can set the floor, but states can go above that. And they can pass laws that are more protective for their employees. And many states certainly have done that. And they're continuing to do that. I think we added 23 new unpaid leave laws to our service last year, just as an example. But where we're really seeing a lot of energy being focused is in the paid leave space. So we know 11 states in the District of Columbia now have passed a paid family and medical leave program. A few of those aren't yet in, um, in force, but they've already been passed. We know at least five states are looking seriously at passing one this year. And we've seen a different variety of states come to the forefront with other types of models that we hadn't seen before. So New Hampshire and Vermont are great examples of, those aren't mandatory programs, they're voluntary programs. And so we're seeing all of these different ways of attacking the same problem. And the problem is that a huge percentage of American employees don't have enough paid leave. Um, and so these, these programs, whether they're mandatory or voluntary, are aimed at trying to give them enough paid leave. And employers are going to have to figure out what their response will be, even to the voluntary programs, right? So it might not be mandated that they participate, but if they don't, and all of their competitors in that state of New Hampshire or Vermont, let's use those as examples, participate, where does that leave me as an employer from a competitive advantage? Then we're also seeing states, Virginia took the lead here, where they're saying, hey, we're going to allow you to have as an insurance product paid family leave that insurance companies can sell to employers and they can offer to their employees on a voluntary basis. A few other states have already fallen in line with that. So all these different flavors, and I think we're seeing states that we didn't expect to be able to pass a full-fledged mandatory PFML program come up with creative ways to get something passed. Uh, again, maybe it's voluntary, but get something passed to help employees in those states. Employers have to keep up with these changes, understand how they apply, and in these voluntary states, decide if they want to participate or not and offer those benefits to their employees. So the complexity can be overwhelming at times, but it isn't something that we can expect to go away anytime in the near future. Wow. And just, I mean, it just makes me think if you're not outsourcing leave, or if you're not working with a partner, you know, such as, as Unum, that is a huge amount of work to be keeping on top of all that, right? Correct. Absolutely. I mean, that's it is hard to keep up with everything. It's hard to know what's coming. Some state laws are, you know, a couple months before they're supposed to be passed, they get extended or, you know, a bill passes and it didn't receive a lot of fanfare and it catches people off guard. So having a, a partner that can have a legal team that's monitoring pending legislation, keeping track of it uh, the entire way so they're ready to go ahead and comply with that or offer a product as soon as that law passes really is a way a lot of employers have found that they can meet their compliance obligations and stay ahead of the curve on some of these issues. And, you know, it's interesting how Unum 
did the survey in March 2023, and it's really showing that leave benefits are considered a strength (laughs) with a lot of plans for expansion. So to your point, the employee expectations are there, but we're also seeing employers are seeing the benefits of offering leave. So an example here, 51% are likely to expand their offerings in the coming year. These companies tend to be those that already offer more benefits and who describe their leave offering as comprehensive to begin with. So that's really interesting. And they already already outsource their leave management. So that's really interesting. Those who are outsourcing, they're seeing the benefits of it and they're expanding their offerings. Also, 23% of employers say they're unlikely to expand. So really one in five is is not looking to expand explicitly. Angel, I'd love your thoughts on this data and what is it saying to you? Yeah, so there's so much good in this survey, right, that has come out, like information that we've been able to glean from it. But I think the, the key point, right, is that the environment's changing. It's changing rapidly and employers understand that if they're going to stay competitive, you've got to change with it, right? You've got to be able to continue to evolve your programs or you're not going to stay competitive and you're going to be left behind, which in this environment, no one wants to be left behind, right? Like they want to continue to be able to attract and retain that really good talent. Um, Also thought like a few other things I thought were really interesting was 55% of the requests that they see coming in, so the most frequent was around parental leave, um, which is on point with what we're seeing, right? Also, but we all saw a lot that said, you know, 49% behind bereavement. So bereavement was really highlighted as something that people were using. Caregiver leave at 43%, that's huge, right? And then when you look at like the other places where they're like most frequently requested, it started to trail off when you got to STD and FMLA. So they're really highlighting these other leaves programs that are outside of just what we consider to be traditional type leave programs, right? Like when you just think, oh, FMLA, STD, their own medical, you know, now they're really highlighting these very specific types of leave programs that people are wanting and they're utilizing, right? I also thought it was really interesting that they go on to talk about how much support they have to provide their employees when they go out on leave. Um, 43% said they provide moderate support, but 35% said they provide significant support to their employees when they go out on leave. So their team's having to walk them through the entire leave process, right? Because they want to help their employees through this, what's usually a complex process. And it's either a really wonderful time in their life or a really hard hard time in their life, right? One of those two things. I think it just further shows how much time it takes from an HR department to not just help their employees with their leave requests, but also back to they're adding all of these programs and they're looking into what everybody else is doing, right? Like that's a lot of time on your HR departments, right? So they're having to spend a lot of their time really focused on leave and not just how does somebody apply for leave, but also like, how do I continue to think about what I need to do next, right? Like what programs I need to do next. Um, also thought it was interesting in this, that survey as well, that 6% of employers said they only offer what is required by law. Only 6%. Everybody else said they had something above what is required by law. Like, I think that just shows, right, there's so much out there, to Ellen's point a few minutes ago, that's happening in the legal landscape. There's so many things changing, right? But employers are still trying to keep up with all of that, which is a lot, but they're also trying to go above what is required, right? Right. So it really shows how important, how much they understand how important it is and how much time it takes, right? How how impactful that is to an HR department. So true. And, you know, just to clarify the union survey, this is non-customers. So this is uh, companies across the U.S., across sizes. And we're going to be linking through to some of the insights from our show notes so you can read more. But Ellen, I'd love for you to pick up on that too. And, you know, that rise in bereavement leave, the caregiving leave. And what is that saying to you? It's saying really that employees are expecting their employers to care for them, which we started out talking about. And and that's a little bit of a new concept for a lot of employers who think my job is to have my employee, you know, come to work and I pay them. I provide them with these benefits. I give them what's legally required. And that's the end of my job. This whole concept of care is for some employers was kind of a squishy um, concept that they really couldn't embrace before the pandemic. 
And now they're saying, nope, my employees expect more from me. They expect me to take care of them financially, emotionally. Uh, employees are having a lot more mental health claims. We all know that. That's just on the rise, and employees are more comfortable asking for help and support there. So employers are recognizing that their role is not just to give someone a paycheck. It's to support that employee both financially, emotionally, and support their family obligations as well. And what I think employers are realizing is that when they do that, it may not seem as if it's in their best interest initially. It doesn't directly impact their bottom line, they might not think, but when they do that, it does actually impact their bottom line because it has employees who are staying at work, who aren't leaving the workforce, who are taking less time off in the long run because they got the time they needed it when they needed it so that condition didn't turn into something much more chronic or catastrophic. So helping care for their employees right when the need is there is a way that does help their bottom line. And employers are starting, I think, to connect those dots and realize that caring for my employees is also a way I can care for our you know, longevity as a corporation and our success as a corporation. And so the two are really, I think, coming together very nicely for employers. And it's it's nice to see that evolution uh, because a little bit of leave today may prevent someone from either going out for months later or not coming back at all later. And so that that's one way employers are starting to look at this. It's so true. And particularly in this labor market that is continuing to be very tight, isn't it? And how I think recent data, 1.7 jobs for every one human in the United States, right? And that that the sheer loyalty you'll gain if you are allowing employee to be there for their family or for themselves at a time of need, like you, you say. I'd love for us to finish with one key message that we can leave with our audience, and I'm including that pun there. Um, <laughs> Angel, if, if you were going to give our audience one key message as they continue to kind of be looking at their leave programs, what would it be? Yeah, so anytime I have a chance to say this, I say it, and Ellen's probably tired of hearing it, but think beyond paid parental leave, right? Like that is not a one size fits all type policy, right? It is very much for a certain population at a certain time in their life, right? Think about having something that's more inclusive to people at different stages of their life. Now, I'm not saying don't do paid parental leaves because that's important. It's kind of table stakes now, right? Like most employers have some type of paid parental leave program, but think beyond that. Think about like, what can I do that's really going to impact, you know, a much wider um, population in my workforce? And I, you know, Ellen and I have seen a lot of unique policies come through. I feel like we're getting more and more and we get all excited and, you know, have to call each other. Look at this policy I just saw. I've never <laughs> heard of this program before, right? So employers are getting really, you like they're coming up with some really unique types of policies to give their employees to make it more inclusive. So I would just encourage everybody to do that. Ellen, what about you? I think you're piggybacking off what Angel said. I agree 100% with everything she said. And it's really what types of benefits you're offering is so important. But I think employers, you shouldn't stop there. Look at how you're applying those policies in your workforce to make sure that they are inclusive and equitable in their application. Uh, so one of the things I always advise to employers is look at how you're defining when the employee can take leave, whether it's bereavement or whether it's caregiver. Are you telling them who their family members are or what relationships are important enough that they can take leave when that person passes away or needs care. It is very simple to say, wait a minute, I need to look at this and look, maybe I only provide bereavement leave if someone's child, parent, or spouse passes away. What about the rest of my employees who might have chosen families? And, or they have different types of relationships where their roommate might be as close to them as their brother or sister. And we're seeing those relationships more and more in our in our employee populations, it doesn't take a lot to wide in your policy to let the employee decide who's important enough to them to take that leave. And that's something that your employees will appreciate and they will feel valued and they'll feel as if that employer really is looking at this through an equitable and an inclusive lens. And that's something I think a lot of employers are looking now to Angel's point, what more can I offer as far as a benefit? And that's great. We want to be doing that, but don't stop there. Look and see how are my benefits applying to my entire population, not just to one or two segments of it. Amazing. 
Ellen and Angel, thank you so much. And for the audience, they both spoke on a recent SHRM webinar that was phenomenal. It was enormous. I mean, it was thousands of people. And we have a link to that in our show description. So thank you both so much for coming on the show and just sharing these insights. Thank you, Clara. I really enjoyed it. Yes, always. Thank you. Unum is a registered trademark and marketing brand of Unum Group and its insuring subsidiaries.